Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at exam style questions for the sampling populations practical. Hi guys, so in this video we're going to tackle a few exam questions that sort of briefly cover the planning and the implementation stage videos that we've already been through. So we've got a question here that's very similar to the example we've been going through, but it's just to give you a bit of context of a different scenario to let you know that there's different situations that you could come across in the exam. So the question says, some students are investigating the factors which influence a parasitic fly which eats dandelions. They wish to estimate the effects of the factors upon a population within a field by taking 20 samples in the field. So they will be investigating the mass of the dandelion, the number of stems, the height of the dandelion from the ground to the tip, the presence or absence of a white patch, which is parasitic action, and the number of the white patches. So it's very similar to the aphid and apple tree leaf example that we've been going through, basically looking at how different features of the dandelion might affect whether it's infected by the parasite fly or not, and to what extent it's infected as well. So part A says, discuss how the students should measure each factor fairly. So it's six marks. So this question is basically talking about how for each of these factors that can affect the action of the fly, or theoretically affect the action of the fly, how they should measure it to make sure that each one is measured in the same way and done fairly so that the conclusion we gather is as accurate as possible. So I'll show you what I've written in my answer here. So I've basically listed it as uh, discussing each factor in turn, because this makes it a lot easier for the examiner to think, you know, have they discussed every factor on the list? I've just done it in order here, basically. So the first one is the mass of the dandelion. So how can they measure the mass fairly every time for each of the 20 dandelions? So for weighing mass, basically, as you pull the dandelions up, or when you remove them for the field, obviously some of them are going to have some soil and some dirt, there might be other bits of grass around it. So first of all I acknowledge that if we want to just measure the dandelion, we have to make sure we always remove all of the soil and dirt from every part, every single plant that we take up, because this could alter the mass of the dandelion. So that's one mark there. The next factor is the number of stems. So basically it should be that we examine every dandelion thoroughly so that we don't miss any stems that are perhaps hiding under leaves or that are very short. And we should basically know how to identify the stems as opposed to leaves that look like stems or different parts of the plant that might look like a stem. So it's very good to be familiar with the plant's anatomy before we start the experiment. The next factor is the height. So always measure vertically from the ground because if we look up it says the height of the dandelion from the ground to the tip. So we have to make sure that we measure vertically for each dandelion plant from the ground to the top of the tallest part of the plant. So this will vary. So that's sort of possibly two marks there because you've talked about how you need to go from the ground to the top and you have to make sure it's the tallest part of the plant. For the presence and the absence of the white patch, we have to know exactly how we recognise it before we start because different white patches could mean different things. They could be different pathogens that are invading the plant. They could just be part of the plant's natural colouring. And so we should be able to identify whether these parasites are present or not. And we have to make sure we examine each of them thoroughly. So you can see that there's also different small points that you can make. And seeing a question with six marks can be a bit daunting. But when you go through the list, you can think, well, if there's six marks and sort of four or five main things in the list that you need to talk about, that means putting a couple of sentences for each one, or one for some and two for others. And that sort of gets you the total number of points. It's just a case of thinking, if I was to gather these dandelions, how can I make sure that... I keep the measurements the same for every single one of them and how I can make it as fair as possible. So that's part A. Part B says, how could the students take a sample which is likely to represent the population of the dandelions in a field? So this is going back to the idea that the whole purpose of this experimental topic for this practical is, is the idea that we take samples because it's too time consuming and too difficult to study the whole population. The point of a sample is to be representative of that population so that we can gather data and understand the characteristics of the population without the need to study the whole thing. For example, we know in uh, human disease, certain symptoms, certain uh, relationships between disease and the way they manifest themselves without having to study every single human that's ever born. We take a group of subjects at different ages, at different heights, different weights, different sort of backgrounds and races, so that we can gather as much information about the population as we can without studying every single human. So I'll show you what I've written here. So we need to make sure that the sample represents the population of the field as a representation. So I've basically said here they should map out the entire field on maybe a piece of paper or some sort of digital map, and then choose an area within that field that covers each section. Or, you know, another way you could word that is just something along the lines of make sure that you take dandelions from all different parts of the field rather than just one area. So it should be a random selection, so you shouldn't just go for the dandelions that stick out at you because they're likely to be the taller ones or the bigger ones. We need to basically 
map all the dandelions and choose ones at random from a map and make sure that they're scattered to cover the area. So it's only a couple of marks but you just need to elaborate the fact that you need to take them from every area that you can and don't take ones that just look appealing or that have flowers. You need to take a, a range based just on their presence, not the features of the dandelion itself. Part C then says, it's a bit of a different type of question this one, it says draw lines to match the measurements made with the type of data that they represent. So in the first video we talked about how we can take different types of data and obviously we use the aphid example to demonstrate these but in most experiments like this you can usually categorize them into qualitative and quantitative and there's different subcategories within them too. So we've got basically the number of stems. So the number of stems is obviously a quantitative thing because it can be a number but it's not a continuous number, it's not a measurement where there can be in between values. It's basically a discrete number, it'll either have no stems, one, two, etc. So this is quantitative discrete. The height of the plants and the height of anything similar to weight or mass is always a continuous variable and it is quantitative because it is again a number. So that must be quantitative continuous. And we can assume that the third one matches the one that's left over but you always should double check this because there could be an error somewhere. So the presence of parasitic patches. So this is a case where it's either present or it's absent. So it's not a numerical thing, so it must be qualitative. And if it's present or absent, then it can only fit in those two things. So it makes sense that it's qualitative categorical, because the categories are yes or no. So that must be that one there. And that gets you the three marks. So the next part says, calculate the mode and the median height of the dandelions. So the results are shown in this table here. So we've got our 20 dandelions, and for each of them we've got our mass and our height, the number of stems, whether there's a patch, yes or no, and how many patches there are, if there are some. So remember the mode is the most common data value within a section, and the median is basically the one that's in the middle when it's put in order. So let's look at this from the table. So we're looking at the height column, and what we want to check first is, is it in order? Well yes it is, in this case it has been put in order for you. So always double check this first. So the mode is basically the one that appears the most. In some situations there isn't a mode whereby each of the data sets is a different number. But what I tend to do is just go through from start to finish and circle any that I see crop up more than once. And because they're in order this makes it a lot easier because all of the ones that are the same will be right next to each other. So here we've got two that are 81. And as I scroll through actually that's the only one that does crop up twice. So that is the mode. So I would then write that the mode equals 81 centimeters. So to find the median we basically have to find the halfway point along the data. So we've got 20 dandelions, so halfway along this is going to be after the first half, which is the tenth value. But what you need to do is remember if you put 20 things in a row the middle is actually between the tenth and the eleventh value. So we almost need to find the 10.5th value. So to do this I find the tenth value, I find the eleventh value, and I basically find the middle of them. The tenth value is 95 centimeters, from the table and the 11th value is 102 centimeters and the middle of those two is basically 98.5 you can find that by adding those two together and then dividing them by two so the median is 98.5 centimeters because that's exactly in the middle if this was a scale from the smallest to the largest that would be the exact middle of the whole set so that's how you find the mode and the median the next question says given that the variance for the heights is 738.12 calculate the standard error so in this case you would be given the equation, but I'll remind you of what the equation is. The standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of how many samples you have, or how many pieces of data you have in this sample. However, we've got the variance, not the standard deviation. So if the variance is 738.12, then the standard deviation is the square root of 738.12, which is a number that we'll be plugging into the calculator in a second. And then we want root of n, so n is 20, so we'll be using root 20. So to find the standard error we have to do root 738.12 divided by root 20. And if you plug this into the calculator you get a rounded up value of 6.08. So that's the standard error. And that's usually about three marks because the first mark recognizes the fact that you've been given the variance, not the standard deviation. You need to really plug them into the right parts of the equation and then getting the answer is usually the final mark as well. So the next part says, given that the mean of the lengths is 105.3 centimetres, calculate the 95% confidence interval that this sample mean represents the population mean. So remember the equation for this, which you would be given again, the 95% confidence interval is the mean plus or minus two standard errors. So we've already calculated the standard errors from the previous question, and the mean is given to us here. 
So the 95% confidence interval will be the mean, which is 105.3, plus and then minus, so you're going to have to do two separate values here, 2 times 6.08. So the lower boundary of this turns out to be 93.14, that's with the minus sign, and with the plus sign you get 117.46. So that's our confidence interval. You can write that as an arrow or you could just put 93.14 to 117.46. Any of that sort of idea would be fine. So the last part says, the students conclude that as the heights of the dandelions increase, the chance of invasion from the parasite increases. Discuss the arguments for and against this conclusion and how they may improve their experiment. So when you see the word discuss, that usually means that you need to really say a for and against for everything that you say. You need to sort of be open-minded. Sometimes you're asked to reach a decision about a conclusion, and if you're asked to say that, you must stick with your decision, but you must always acknowledge the other side of the argument. That's generally what the word discuss tends to mean. So I'll show you what I've written here. So I first put that the table shows that, so I've mentioned the table here, that higher dandelions, so or dandelions with greater height, tend to have parasites with some exceptions. So I've just acknowledged that there is a trend because you want to say what is the argument for their conclusion. There is a trend in the table. The taller ones without infection may be infected but not show patches. So it's just acknowledging the fact that just because they don't have a patch there may still be infection. It's just acknowledging that there are other ways that it may be infected and other ways that it may show. It could be supported by the idea that taller plants attract or expose themselves more to the flies. So there's always a good idea to refer to the science. Why might it be that taller dandelions are more likely to be attracted by the flies? That's because they're taller, they probably have bigger flowers, the flowers may be more obvious to the flies. There's lots of different reasons, but it's just acknowledging what could be the argument for this conclusion, and how could they improve their experiment. They could see or test for other signs of infection from the parasite to see if the trend is more clear. So for those that were the exceptions, whereby you had taller plants without patches, it might be good to work out, okay, how else can we test whether these taller ones are actually being infected or not? And again, a good point to always make here is that they could also take more samples of the dandelions. And that's always a good way of saying how you can make your conclusion more reliable. That kind of answer comes up a lot of the time. So it's basically just illustrating to you that when you're faced with a conclusion or when you're asked to come to a conclusion, you should always talk about why it might be wrong, why it might be right, and basically try and argue the scientific explanation of why this could be. And always mention, even if you're not really prompted, I think it's a good idea to mention, how could we improve this? How could we test more of this? How could we look at it from different angles? That sort of thing. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.